Welcome. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a talk today which I'm calling Principles of, of Elegance, which is, is probably a little bit of a departure from many of the talks I do, in that I often, I often like to talk about very precise technical topics, uh, and I like to work with, with code and show you sample code. And today I'm going, I'm going to talk more about um, sort of very vague principles of, of coding, and a lot of the ideas you'll probably think that you, 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 may, be, uh, you may be find it harder to get a, a, a grasp on the, the, the sort of generality of what I'm saying. This is, this is rather, I, I, I'm going to go even further back. Can you, can you hear me okay? What, how, how about now? You're okay with that, okay. I'm, I'm getting feedback in my ears. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna dot a few examples uh, through, the, through the presentation from, uh, from Rapture, which is uh, a library I've been writing for the last few years, uh, which will hopefully demonstrate or give, give some credibility to some of the, uh, the, 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 more, the more general claims I'll make. But uh, by, by all means, uh, challenge me on the, uh, on, on the, on the assertions. Um, tweet, tweet to me at uh, a Propensive if, uh, if you have any thoughts on some of the things I'm saying. I'm, I'm going to go through a number of these, these, these principles which by no means are exhaustive. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to, to suggestions and, uh, and, and, and criticisms. So uh, don't hold back. So first of all, maybe I should define what I, I think elegance is. Um, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it says, combining simplicity, power, and a certain ineffable grace of design. So that, that's um, a, a, a dictionary which, uh, which claims something is ineffable, is, is not really doing its job. It's meant, it's meant to tell you what it is, rather than say that it just can't, be, uh, can't be explained. Uh, but we'll, we'll try and explore that. In my mind, when it comes to writing Scala code, there are a couple of things which, um, which kind of combine to, to form my idea of elegance. One of them is having code which is intuitive, which is readable. Code which you can look at and, and immediately understand, or at least have a good idea about what it's doing. And the other is type safety having your code be robust and allowing you to be confident in your code. And often these things don't mesh well. And I think if you can, if you can work to combine these two things well, I think you, you, you have what I will call elegant code. That, that, that is, that is my, my, my basis for this talk. So one question you can ask is, how, how is Scala different from, from other languages? Does, does elegance apply to, uh, to, to Python or, or Haskell? It does, but I think there are ways in which, uh, there are specific uh, ways in which Scala is different from, from those other languages. One thing is that I, th I think more than most languages, Scala uh, transcends different abilities. You can approach Scala coming from, coming from just some Java experience and, and have a reasonable idea about some, some, some basic, uh, basic, basic concepts. You, you can write code that works very quickly. If you, know, if you know Java. But at the same time, you can do some really advanced things. You can, you can, you can do some type level programming. And it's the same language, it's the same, same domain you're working in, but we're using the same language from, from the very basic stuff to the, to the most advanced. And Scala, I think, is better than many languages at doing that. Not, it's by, by no means perfect, and I'm sure many of you are thinking Scala makes loads of mistakes at, uh, at, at, at trying to appeal to too broad a, a, a church of users. Um, and, and, and Scala's a big language, and in, in, in being such a large language with, with, with many features, it kind of encourages inventiveness. It encourages you to try combining features in different ways. I mean, it, it, I mean, it encourages me. I don't, know if, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I, I, I frequently end up, um, when it, whenever uh, a new major version of Scala comes out and uh, some new, new features get added to the added to its powers, I think, well, how can I use this feature with all of the other features I've got? And uh, I know Adrian hates this, because I, 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 then, I then go and find, find like esoteric corner cases that, uh, that, that, that nobody considered. 
Uh, and, 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 and being, being this, uh, this language which I think is, is unique, there are some uh, unique solutions it needs as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, as I said, this, this isn't exhaustive, but I'm going to try and put into eight core principles my, my thoughts about how you can de design better libraries, better APIs in Scala. Some of these do actually work with, some, some of these principles do apply to other, other domains as well, but, uh, but, but many are, are quite specific to Scala. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, they're, they're a work in progress, feedback is, is very welcome. And another thing, another thing to note is these principles are with the goal of writing elegant code. You may have other goals. You may have performance as a, as, as a, as a, as a key goal in, in the code you're writing, in which case you can, you can maybe sacrifice or compromise on some of these ideas. If you want code to be readable and you want it to be robust and type safe and maintainable, then this, this is uh, my, my, my definition of elegance. This is what these principles are for. So, number one. Keep your, keep your public APIs small, keep them minimal. And uh, this, this obviously applies to, to many languages. We want, we want things to be easily understood, we want them to be simple, and by keeping, keeping APIs small, having fewer methods, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we allow them to be easier to maintain, easier to understand, and also easier to compose. And uh, this, this, is, uh, th this gives us a lot of flexibility to combine things in, in different ways without introducing more uh, complicated corner cases. We want to avoid, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately using the word polluting here, polluting public APIs with details that the end users don't need to see, that they don't need to be aware of. Hide stuff from your users if it's not relevant to them. Keep internals internal. You can expect users to import stuff with wildcard imports. It's the easiest way if you're, if you're using a lot of things from the same package. So don't have additional things in those, in those packages that aren't, aren't relevant. Make sure that every type, be it a class, trait, case class, object, uh, every, every value, every method, every implicit that, that is imported in a particular, from a particular package has justification for being there. In general, try to have fewer methods rather than more. Don't, don't provide specific convenience methods. Provide general versions. Make them generic if you can. Take advantage of uh, public and uh, sorry, private and uh, protected modifiers. If stuff shouldn't be accessible to the, on the outside, then, then, then take advantage of, of, of these. Instead of using overloading, be more general. Use type classes. Who here is, uh, can, can you just put your hands up, who is familiar with type classes? That is encouraging. I, the, the, the number of people who put their hand up, I think, goes up every, every year I do a talk. And I remember about four years ago, um, it, it was just like a, a, a cluster of a few people who would, uh, who would raise their hand when I asked about type classes. Uh, and I, I think, I think as, a, as, as a community, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of learning of the benefits of, of, uh, of, of type classes over some of the more, uh, more, more traditional ways of, of doing similar things. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about type classes later. One uh, really simple trick, and it's not, I, 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 don't, I don't claim this is profound in any way, but hide types inside others, nest them. So, for example, if we, if we start off uh, with, um, with, with code like this, I don't know what foo does, but we've, we've got a foo. We've got subclasses of foo called basic foo and advanced foo. Who knows what they are? But we've got three types that are visible in our project package there. Instead, we could write these like the second, second half of the slide. Put the basic and advanced versions inside the foo object. Again, this is, this is not profound. This is just saying nest things more deeply, hide stuff away, take advantage of, um, of, of keeping, uh, of, of the namespace facilities of Scala to keep, keep APIs clean. 
On to the second, second principle. And this, is, this is one you probably know well. Choose your names wisely. Naming stuff is difficult. Or as I think, I think someone tweeted recently, naming stuff isn't difficult, but we just can't be bothered to do it most of the time. Uh, it's kind of fun to name stuff, but it, it, it comes with uh, risks and, and rewards. So everything we, everything we work with, all the, all, all the entities, the types and the terms in Scala, they need names. We need, we need a way of describing them, both when we're communicating with, uh, with, with colleagues and coworkers and when we're writing, when, when, we're, when we're referring to them in code. So we need to, we need to pick these names to be, to be convenient. And there's, there's, there's a, a number of different factors which should, should influence that. The names should communicate something. It should be possible as, uh, I mean, myself as a speaker of English, uh, you, you as, as speakers of a variety of different languages, but I, I, I assume things are listening to me also English. You, you should be aware of the, what, what the word means. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, English comes with uh, a large vocabulary of different words, with, each with subtle nuances that, that may infer other things as well as the, 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 the core meaning. And we get these preconceptions about, uh, preconceptions of meanings of words when we, when we see, when we see a, a, a noun or a verb in code for the first time. And this can be both good and bad. Sometimes the meaning, the, 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 the more nuanced meaning, aligns with our, our, our desired meaning, our, our intentions for that. But we have to be careful because sometimes other people can assume something else about, about the, the intended meaning. We have a big vocabulary, but we have to, uh, but, but, but it, we have to be careful about the words we choose within that to apply to different, uh, di different, different scenarios. So some questions you can ask. Does, if, if we're naming a method, does the, does the method implement something we're already familiar with? Can we reuse an existing name? Or do we need to actually branch off and choose a different name that is decidedly distinct from the one we're familiar with. This is, this is the choice we have to make. For methods, for objects, for types that are very pervasive through a lot of code, they're going to appear very often. Short names are generally better. We don't want to have to refer to very long names frequently. But, if there's, if there's ambiguity, if, there are, if there's the opportunity to misinterpret something, then we should probably prefer longer names. One specific case is with implicits in, in Scala. Now, if you have two implicits in scope at the same time with identical names, then one will shadow the other. You won't be able to see the one that's imported or defined first. The one which is imported or defined last wins. Now this happens if they have the same name. So you have to be careful about, your, about, about how you name implicits. Generally, if you have a longer name, more specific name, a more descriptive name, there's less chance it will clash with somebody else's implicit or even your own implicit. And one convenient thing in particular with implicits is you, you, you really need to refer to them directly. You, you can import them maybe in a, maybe in a package with a, with, a, with a wild card. So you don't need to refer to that long name. So give, it, give, give implicits a, a, a long name. There's probably a lot more I could say about, uh, about naming things. Uh, Howie Lee actually did a very good blog post on, uh, on, on naming stuff, which goes into a lot more detail than I've got time for. So if you can, if you can find... Uh, Consciousness and names. Uh, take a look at that. It's it's well worth reading. So this is this is very this idea is very dear to my heart. Embrace the type type system. The type system is your friend, often your best friend in uh, in the in the in the programming world. What does this mean? I find that having a type system empowers me. The constraints it provides, the, the, the force, forcing me to go down a, a straight and narrow path liberates me to try stuff, because I know the, the, the compiler will be watching my back. I know that if I've defined, if I've defined my types correctly, the type system will, 
um, constrain what I can do with those. It'll stop me doing things that are guaranteed to fail at runtime. And this gives, gives us confidence to reason about our code. It means if we, were, if we attempt a large refactoring, and we're working entirely with very type-safe code, we can make all those changes. We can, and I, I, I've, I've, I've said this many times before, and I've, I've done it on numerous occasions. I've, I've spent a day, sometimes a week, refactoring code, changing types, moving methods, moving classes, splitting stuff up, all, all sorts of changes. And every iteration I will compile, I'll get a whole screen full or multiple screenfuls of, of compiler type errors. But once I've gone and fixed all of those, and the compiler tells me exactly which line I need to go to to make the fix, once I've done it, it, it still seems remarkable to me that this code will often work first time. And that is the type system that is, that is helping you there. So here's a few specific, uh, specific thoughts. How, how, do, how, do we, how can we take advantage of the type system more than, than, than maybe we do already? So avoid, if you can, referring to primitive types like ints uh, and, and also to, to, to strings. Strings, using a string to store data is, um, is not very precise. Um, what, what, you, you have an int, what, what is the int? Is it, is it representing a length? Is it a, an age? Could we, could we actually introduce types to represent more precisely what the semantic information we're representing is, rather than just having the very generic idea of an int or a string or a double? You can extend this a bit further to, to structural types. Uh, not, 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 um, not, not, not structural types in the sense of, uh, uh, you, you maybe know the feature of Scala that you can define a type in terms of the, the, the members. Structural types in terms of um, uh, examples being uh, op option, option and either and, and tuples. Why use a tuple when you can use a case class? You can convey some additional semantic information with the case class. You can give it a name. You can make that case class distinct from another case class with a different name. You don't get that with, with two, di two different tuples. As far as the compiler is concerned, as long as the parameters are all, ha all have matching types, they are the same type. And generally, I would say set a very low bar to introducing new types to your code. Types are cheap. Debugging is expensive. If you're representing a different concept, if you're representing something that you have no representation for yet, maybe a new type is, is, the, is the solution. And one of the most important things about when you design types is to ensure that they're representing only the states, only the, the states of data that are possible. Don't allow your types to represent impossible states. Because if you can't create an, in, if you can't create an instance of that type, you can't possibly be passing around data that, that, is, that is impossible, that is broken. You can't, you, your, your, your failure if, if, you, if, you, if you have an impossible state in some, in some, in, in some way, your failure, ha failure happens at the point you try to put that data into a value. If you can't do it, if the type can't represent it, then that is the point you need to fix it. And you discover that at compile time. You don't discover it at runtime. One, one side note is that uh, especially regarding not using primitive types. Um, obviously, primitive types are, are faster in many circumstances. Uh, value classes can help sometimes with this. Um, so if, if, if you're not familiar with um, the feature of value classes in, in Scala and performance is, is important, uh, you don't have to compromise on performance a lot of the time when you're, when you're representing primitive-like things with, um, with, with, with uh, with other types, value classes may be able to help. 
And also, not so much related to the type system, but you can also, you can also use macros to enforce some constraints. So I've got an example here from, from Rapture of the uh, representation I use for CSS. Does anyone here do any web programming? You lucky bunch. <laughs> um, you, you are probably at least aware that uh, styles on, on web pages are generally, uh, generally written in CSS. And I have a type in, in, uh, in Rapture representing CSS. And this here, I don't know if you can see the pointer, this, this looks like a string, but it is prefixed with CSS. Now, what this does is, this is like the, um, the, the interpolator strings with a, where you prefix a string with an S and it will substitute values inside that. I've prefixed it with CSS, which actually invokes a macro on the contents of this string literal here. And what that will do at compile time is read through this text here and it will parse it and it will check that border color is a valid CSS uh, attribute name. It'll, it'll validate that uh, border width is, is, exists as well. If you were, if, if for example you wrote border WIDHT, you made a, just a simple, simple spelling mistake, that's a compile error. You find out at compile time. You don't find out when you, you, you produce the CSS style sheet and your your border width is the wrong, the wrong value. As API designers, you should be thinking about the user experience. The users are programmers. And many of the same ideas that exist in, 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 in UX design, completely different discipline, or largely different discipline from from programming, many of the same principles apply equally. Maybe, maybe they need to be contorted a little bit to, 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 to fit the domain, but many of the same ideas will apply to designing APIs. The people using, your, your users are, are, are programmers, so you can make, you can make some, some guesses as to uh, their expectations. Um, and also, Within, within their expectations, there, there, are, there are different users with different abilities. And you can take advantage of these. You can, you can presume certain things about your users. They have certain expectations. They have familiarity with, with certain ideas. And sometimes you should take advantage of those. You should, you should try and have some, I mean, it, it, it comes down in, in some sense to having emotional intelligence about what your users will experience when they, when they see your library, when they, when they try to use your API, what their expectations are. Sometimes you need to kind of go against the grain a little bit. Sometimes you, you can acknowledge that the, 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 the status quo of, peop, of, of, of the general understanding is wrong or maybe just not perfect, and you need to, you need to, you need to educate people you need to go against the, uh, the, the common wisdom and actually say, we're, we're doing it this way because some, some, some reason which you, you, you can hopefully justify. But, but don't, don't do what other people do simply because other people do it. Do, do what's right, go against the grain when you need to. You should keep boilerplate to, to a minimum. I mean, you all, you all know this. Everyone hates boilerplate. It's, it's frustrating to write, it's frustrating to maintain. So every line in your code, every, every line you write, every line you, you read, should have some significant meaning. I mean, maybe that meaning changes the context, maybe it's an import, which, which changes the context of, of the, 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 the subsequent code. Maybe it's calling some, some side-affecting operation. But, but every line should be significant. It shouldn't just be uh, perfunctory code which, uh, which, which exists only to, to satisfy the, uh, the, 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 the compiler. And has anyone here programmed in COBOL? 
Come on, any more of you? I, I think there's maybe three, three hands. Uh, so, so COBOL was designed to, to be very readable to, the or, to ordinary people. And you, you, you'd, you'd write code like add seven to X, I think. I, I never wrote any COBOL, but uh, I, 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 I saw some once and that's all I remember. And it was very, very verbose. But you could, you could look at it, you could read it, and you could understand what it was doing. It was in plain English. And the libraries and APIs that we designed should, should try and do the same thing. I mean, not necessarily converting into, into English prose the, uh, the, the, the operations you're doing, but you should be able to, to, to read it without much knowledge of the language and, and have an idea as to what is happening. That, that's very, very desirable. So I'm, I'm very quickly gonna run through some, um, some usability heuristics. Um, draw parallels with the real world. Real world. Try and associate things in your code with, with things in, in real life. Consistency and standards. Uh, error prevention. The, these are all uh, what, 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 what I'm, I'm calling heuristics uh, for, for usability. Recognition, not recall. So in, in a, in a uh, programming context, this maybe means recognizing what a method does, not so much by its name, which you can recall, but by the type, the return type, the types of the parameters. Recognize the, the method by its shape, not by its, by its name. Flexibility and efficiency of use. Aesthetic and minimalist design. These were written uh, in, a, in, a, in a blog post which has nothing to do with programming. These came straight from uh, 10 usability heuristics for user interface design. But reading through that list, a lot of these seem very, very applicable to, uh, to, to programming in Scala. Uh, I think there were, uh, the, 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 there were 10 of them, and uh, I've, got, I've got six there. The other, the other four weren't so relevant, but uh, we, we did at least find, find six. Now, one thing I do when I'm, when I'm designing a library is I want to optimize my, my code for the use site. The complexity should go in the library so that the, so that the users of that library benefit the most. I don't want to force my, my end users to write boilerplate just to make my job as a library designer easier. And one way I do this is to first think about the code I want to write at the use site. And I'll, I'll write some sample code. I will, and you, the, the, the more experience you have at this, the, the better you get at doing it, doing it right first time or, or, or second time. But first of all, write, write down some code that, that won't compile because it's got no, it, it's, it's calling APIs which don't exist, but, but write it down and, and uh, make, make sure it, it, um, it, it meets as many of those heuristics on the previous slide as, as you can. Maybe also write some code you don't want to compile. Write, write some code that you expect to fail and that, that you want the compiler to help you catch. And then, then try and fill in the definitions that make it work. And iterate when it doesn't work. Maybe you have to, after a while, you, you, you persevere for a long time trying to get your definitions to, to compile your sample code. Maybe there are times when you have to compromise. You have to say, well, actually, it's not possible to write my my end user code exactly like this. So change it a little bit, change, change, the, uh, change the DSL slightly, and then have another go. And this is a little bit like test-first development, uh, except, except test-first development is, is typically testing that the methods do the right thing at runtime. We're, we're not so concerned about that. I mean, I'm, 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 if, if, if things compile, I'm, I think they probably work, which is uh, <laughs> which is probably one reason why they often don't. But uh, the the hardest bit is often getting them to to, to compile. And uh, it, it, I'm 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 being I'm I'm being quite frivolous with that that comment. But a lot of the time, if you if you can get the types to work, if you can get it to compile, getting it to work at runtime does actually become very trivial. Uh, so uh, I, I, I very much promote uh, use site first design. Now I'll, I'll show you an example of one library uh, that's, that's part of Rapture where I did this. I wanted to represent HTML, 
to go with my CSS, of course. And I wanted to make it look like this. This is, this is, um, this is some code I wrote before I wrote, or sim similar to, uh, to, to some code I wrote before I wrote the library. I wanted to be able to write HTML tags with a head tag and a body tag, but I wanted it to look like method calls. I wanted to have, uh, for example, a P tag with a, uh, a style attribute there. I wanted content to go inside that as a, as a string. Uh, and I, I went ahead and I worked for several days and I managed to get this to compile. And you see we've got the, the, the type safe CSS uh, in there on the, on the style tag as well. Uh, and I, I managed to get this to compile after, after a lot of work. Uh, additionally, we do some additional checking on here that, that's not obvious from the sample, but the library will check that the tags you nest inside other tags are valid in that position. I implemented the HTML5 spec in the type system. You can put a head inside an HTML, you can put a body inside HTML. You can't put a title inside a body, that doesn't work, it's a compile error, you get, a, you get an, uh, an error message. So that, that was, that was uh, the, the, the consequence of writing, writing these, uh, these, these, uh, these samples first and then trying to compile them and then, then trying to make sure that the, that the failure cases definitely failed. And I use this as an example because it was a lot of work to make this kind of syntax work. I had to use um, setter syntax, which maybe many of you don't know. Uh, Scala has this syntax for defining setters. Um, look, look it up, it, it's been in Scala since, uh, since the very early days. Varags, I had to use implicit parameters. That was a feature I used. Implicit conversions. I needed chained implicits. I had to use existential types. I had to use both use site and definition site variants. This is all in the same library. Uh, I used dependent method types. I'm, I can't remember how many more of these. Singles and types were used. Every, almost everything, uh, everything went in here. And, and because, because uh, that lot didn't work by itself, I just hacked it until it did. And all of this lot combined gave me this HTML library, and it works. So, uh, I'm just gonna check. I'm short on time, aren't I? I've got 10 minutes. I'm gonna skip over this 0.5 and go straight to 0.6, about modularity. Modularity well, first I'll define it. How easily can components be separated and recombined? That's the dictionary helping me out again. Type classes are the one word solution to, or as, as close as we have to a solution to, to modularity. Uh, use type classes as much as you can. <laughs> I, I, I can't, in, 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 term, in terms of um, specific concrete ideas, go first to type classes. Forget inheritance. It's, uh, it, it's taken me 10 years to, to start thinking like this. And um, I, 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 normally, I, I normally jump straight to using uh, type classes uh, rather, than, rather than overloading, rather than uh, in inheritance and a few other places that, that they, they can apply as well. So not everybody put their hand up when I asked about type classes. So I'll, I'll give a very brief overview of one reason why they give you a lot more flexibility. Imagine we're writing a, a we, we've got a project which I'll say this, this, is, this is your project. You're, you're writing a JSON library because who isn't these days? And from your your, your, your JSON project has dependencies. These are the, the upstream projects. And maybe in, in the upstream projects, for example, the, the standard library, um, a type like string is defined. We're defining JSON, and then people using our library would maybe define a type like invoice. We're, we're gonna represent invoices in, in JSON. 
So I think it's fundamental when you're trying to understand the relevance of, of type classes and why, the, why they're beneficial is you think in terms of upstream and downstream dependencies. Now, using inheritance, we could define the capability of being able to write something, to be able to write your, 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 your data or your, your, your type somewhere. Maybe you, you're writing it to disk. Imagine that's what, what writable means in this, in this context. If we wanted to make our JSON type writable using inheritance, we would just extend something called writable. That's how we would say that JSON stuff is writable. And we would define that in the JSON project. In our downstream project, if you wanted to make invoices writable, then we could extend writable. Uh, and, and our invoices would be writable. Now, we can't, we can't down here say that JSON is writable. So if the person who wrote the JSON library didn't anticipate writability of JSON, then there's no way down here in our downstream project to actually say that JSON is writable. And we can't ever say that strings are writable because they don't inherit this writable trait. So we're limited in, in well, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't retrofit these capabilities to, to, to types we don't already own. Now with type classes, we can define a, a writer type class. And in our JSON project, we can define a writer for JSON, but we can also go back and define a writer for strings. Even though we didn't define string, string is in the, in, in, in the, um, in, in the Java standard library, um, we, we, we can still define a writer in our JSON project. Going downstream to, our, to, to somebody else's uh, in, invoice projects, they, they can define the writer for invoices, they can define the writer for JSON, they can define the writer for string. And it doesn't just apply to writers. You can, you can have any number of different capabilities represented by type classes. And you have the flexibility of adding that capability to existing types. So the, the, the idea is that type classes allow you to separate data types uh, from the capabilities that they have. You can define them in different projects at different times. We can take this a little a step further and, and use uh, extension methods. Extension methods aren't, uh, aren't, aren't really a, a, a feature in their own right in Scala. It's just a, an application of, of, of uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern, if you like, of uh, use, using implicits to, to, uh, to, to add. It looks like you add methods to types that, that weren't designed with those methods originally. You extend them. We, we do this in, in, in Scala with, with implicits. That's, that's the means. And um, generally, we're providing uh, more, more um, well, it, it, it's ad hoc polymorphism for, for types. It's not, it's not polymorphism defined by subtyping. And uh, Key, key point is that you can retrofit this functionality to, to, to types that, uh, that, you, that you don't own or control. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because we're short on time. And uh, I will also skip to point eight. You're not missing much, don't worry. Back to, back to types and, and, uh, and, and how much I love types over values. You should, as much as possible, prefer types. Give, your, give, give the compiler more information at compile time. It can't help you about the stuff it doesn't know about. It can't help you with information that's only available at runtime. So if you can promote a value to a type, and I'll, I'll show you how this could potentially work later, uh, if you can promote a value to a type, then there is a, there's a chance that the compiler can help you. And that's something you should, you should take advantage of. It, it's it's type-level programming, basically. It's not you're, you're, you're taking failures away from runtime and converting them into compile errors. Uh, H-lists are a well-known example of, of uh, type-level programming. And uh, Scala has... Uh, currently um, 
some limited support for singleton types. So this is a type representing an exact value, like a string. So the string foo, in quotes, has a type associated with it. There's only one instance of that type, it's the value foo as a string, but there's a type, a singleton type representing that, and that's, that's a feature of Scala. It's a little bit complicated to access at the moment. It might become easier in the future, but um, at, at the moment it, it, it's, it's usable and there are things we can do with it. Of course, we can't completely eliminate runtime values unless we write a very boring, completely deterministic program. We have inputs, so there's, there's, no, there's no silver bullet here. You still have to work with some dynamic, dynamic data. So here's an example of uh, what, what I described before as promoting a, a value to a type. This is from the internationalization library in Rapture, which allows you to have a representation of an internationalized string. Now this, this string here, um, we, we use the string context again, and I've, I've got different, different string contexts representing uh, dozens of different languages. So this is an English string, en, it says hello world, and I'm combining it with the, the ampersand with a French string, uh, bonjour le monde, and we combine them into a single value message. So the message is saying hello, and we, we can have a, an English and French version. Now, we can try and access, this, this is like a map. Think of it as a, a map from, from language to, uh, to, to, to an actual string. We can call message en. Now, notice that the en is in square brackets. That's because en is a type here. And the type of message, which is inferred, we don't have to specify the type, but it'll, it'll be inferred, knows that because it was created from combining an English string with a French string, that it is a message, uh, an internationalized string of English and French. That is encoded in the type, which, which we don't see, but it's, it's there. The type system knows about it. So when we try and access the English version and print it out, that's fine, that works. If we try to access the German version, this is not a runtime error, it's a compile error. So this is an example of promoting what would typically be a value to a, a, a compile time checked type. So th those, those were the, um, those were, did I do seven or did I do six of the, of the eight principles? It was a different, it was a different six from the, the, the six I did in New York when I ran out of time as well. Uh, there's, there's some hurdles and, 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 and caveats to point out on, uh, on, on, on these. A lot of this is difficult, and the, the, the tooling isn't great. So we, we, we have, for example, situations where there's an implicit being used from somewhere, and we, just looking at the code, you can't see where it comes from. We can ask questions like, what, what, what do I need to do to, uh, what, what do I need to import to get an implicit that will satisfy this method that's asking for one? We, 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 don't have, we don't yet have good solutions to this, but it, it's an area where, where tooling can help. And also there's the implicit not found annotation. We, if, 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 we, if we have a type that is being used uh, as, uh, for, for implicit parameters, we can annotate the, the definition of that type with implicit not found, and we'll get a custom error message that, that, that can maybe give advice on, on what you need to import. This is what happens if you try to use a future without importing um, the, the, the necessary packages. And I can never remember what the packages are, so I just try and use the future and then copy-paste the, copy -paste the import that I need. Uh, and obviously, um, improving documentation and tooling uh, would, would help there. There's the possibility of naming conflicts. I, I, had, I had one of the principles as, as naming stuff is, is difficult. And, uh, the chance of having a, uh, a, a clash with two, two different libraries is real, but it's, it's un also infrequent. Um, but th there's kind of a problem if you have two libraries which define a type that has the same name that does different things, and you, you want to use those two libraries in some other project. There's, there's, there's a conflict, and maybe something's got to give. One of those libraries has to, has to change its name, uh, to change the name of that particular type. But it's an evolutionary process. It will, it will happen slowly. The ecosystem will, will deal with it. Now, I mentioned before that 
types often get inferred. And we don't have to see the types. Types get inferred. Um, they, they, they get inferred for return types. Types get inferred for type parameters. And it's, it's kind of convenient if we're working with large, complex, structured types. It's convenient that, that we don't see them a lot of the time, that we never have to write them down in, 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 certain, in certain cases. But they'll get exposed when we have a type mismatch, if we try to use the wrong kind of H list uh, in, in, uh, when, when, when a different H list is, is expected. That's a type error. It's quite, quite correctly a type error, but it's actually quite hard to read those error messages and work out what mistake we made and to know how to fix it. So there's a question, can we, can we do better than this? So I'm, I'm over time, but I'm, I'm just gonna go through one, uh, one weird trick to, to give you nicer uh, type error messages. So first of all, look at the types you, you um, find, find the subset of types in your, in your system that you want to, uh, that, that you want to handle that you want to handle the mismatches for. And then write, a, write an implicit conversion from, from one type to the other, from, from the bad type to the good type. So this in itself won't solve the problem. What we need to do, I mean, it, it'll, it'll make it compile, sure. Your code will compile, and then depending on your implementation, it will, which is presumably to implement it with, with null or triple question mark, it will fail at runtime. So we need to do more than this. We need to implement it with a macro. So we've got that, that implicit, which will convert from the bad type to the good type, and we're gonna implement it with a macro. And the macro will then look at the parameter type of that implicit conversion, and it'll look at the expected return type of the implicit conversion. And when the macro gets instantiated, we can see those types, we can destructure them, we can work out, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of work to dig into those types to get the, get the information you need, but you can then compare them uh, at, at runtime in the macro. And then you can print out a nice error message based on, based on whatever analysis you decide to do on the, the mismatch between the types. So in the case of mismatch H lists, one thing you could do is find out if there's, you could do a diff, parameter by parameter diff on the two H lists. And, and, and find out what the problem is, and say, write, write, write a nice message out, say, um, you, you, you've, you've missed a parameter here, we expected a, a string in this gap. And then most importantly, after printing the nice error message, the macro must fail, it must fail to expand. Now what this, what this means is in the compiler, the macro will get run, it will print out the error message, but the compiler does not see that as a successful compilation. We can't have a successful compilation because we've got, we, we still generally do have a type mismatch. We haven't fixed that. We've just, we've just done something useful in reporting the error message before we abort. So this is, this is one, oh, I've got one, one weird trick for fi fixing your, uh, your type error messages. Um, one caveat is that this, this doesn't work so well if you're using uh, covariance. Um, but, but for invariant types, this, this works very well, and I use it. I use it in a few places. So very quickly to run through the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the principles of, of elegance, keeping your API minimal, naming stuff well, focus on the user experience, try to be modular, uh, embrace, embrace the type system as much as you can, uh, accommodate, accommodate users learning as they are, as they are starting to use your, uh, use your API. Think about scoping and organizing. This, this was the one I didn't do. Uh, and, and where possible, use types rather than values. So going back to the, back to the original uh, dictionary quote, elegance is combining simplicity, power, and a certain ineffable grace of design. I, I, don't think I've, um, I don't think I've fully explained away that, that ineffability of, uh, of, of, of elegance. 
Um, but hopefully I've made some progress into, uh, in, in, into understanding it. And uh, that's all I've got. Uh, I, I think someone will probably confirm I don't have time for questions. Do I have time? The, the, um, okay, so stop, stop me if, uh, if, I, if I'm going way over. But there's, there's, uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, there's, there's microphones there and there. If you want to run forward and, uh, and, and ask. Uh, thanks for the awesome talk. I have one question. Uh, in one of the slides, you said that to, you advised to avoid the structural types such as option, either, and tuple, for example. Yeah. And use the case classes, for example, case class instead of them. But for option and either, we have a monadic instance, of, and for tuple, we have a bifunctor, which we don't have by default for the case classes. Moreover, just by looking at the signature, for example, at the option, you immediately got the meaning that, like, the value, for example, might not exist. And if you will incorporate it to, in the case class, you would, like, you would need to, like, name something. Like, I don't know, something or nothing, whatever, to bring the same, like, the reasoning from the type. So, yeah, so that's basically my, my concerns about this um, advice. I, I, so I, I, didn't, I didn't hear all of the points there, but, but you, you, you raised the question that... Yeah, the, uh, first, the first thing that uh, f if we would use the just case classes, we would not have default monadic instances and the B functor, which we have for the tuple, for example, or for the options. And moreover, looking at the, just for example, as an option, we immediately understand that this value might not be present, so we should do something right. about it. So uh, you, you're, you're right, there is a, there is a bit of a trade-off there, and you get a lot of stuff for free if you're using the more generic, the more generic types. Uh, I, I, did have, um, I did have a couple of slides on, um, on, on chaining implicits, which give us a way to um, take an existing type class, an existing set of type classes, and have them transformed by, 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 by chaining them through another type class, um, which, which does allow us to make some progress uh, in, into automatically providing a lot of the functionality that, that, that exists um, that, that other people have provided um, for, for our, own, our own new types that we introduce. Uh, I would also raise the question as to whether we want to get all of that stuff for free or not. Um, there's, there, there's the risk that maybe you shouldn't be... You, you shouldn't be um, um, when, when, when you're working with very, very generic structural things, often, um, often, often you, you, you don't want them to be interchangeable. I think that, that, that's, uh, um, that, that's kind of the key, the key point I was trying to make. But I, 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 do, I do appreciate that, that there are some, some trade-offs there. Uh, yeah, question there. Yeah, uh, it might be in... Uh, I don't know if it was in the slides that you skipped over, but do you have any... Uh, guidelines for exceptions, like should a library author expose exceptions? Or... Uh, do, do, do I have any uh, advice or principles for yeah. exceptions? Um, th th there's, th there's, there's another talk I've done on this. Uh, in fact, the, the talk I did at, at, uh, at Scala Days last year, um, I, di I did talk a lot about exceptions. Um, I, I, I don't know about formulating them into a, um, a, a, a principle, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I talked. Um, do a, do a, um, I think look on look on YouTube for, or if if, if the if the Scarlet Days talks from last year are online, uh, check check them out. Um, I, I, yeah, I've, I've talked a lot about exceptions before. Uh, I think oh, last last question. Okay. Yeah, you said uh, don't put too many methods in the API, and I think oh, so say, say say that again. Don't put too many methods in the API. Don't put too many methods in the API. And I think it's uh, important to not to put too few methods. So I know this <laughs> anti-pattern in the C library. You have this method IO control, which is basically 100 methods in one, and you just have a lot of ifs there. And so I think if you have an implemented method that already starts with an if to go to two quite different implementations, then I would rather put two different methods there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, th th these, aren't, um, th th these aren't ever going to be hard and fast rules. Um, I, I, would, I would maybe 
add to add add the um, add to that in 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 saying that maybe if if you are finding that you're adding lots of methods to the same type, you should potentially be having two, three, four types representing those 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 those, those, those different. Things like try, try and try and work out what the concept is you're you're trying to represent and keep each of them small. Um, again, the, the, these are vague concepts. They're they're, they're kind of abstract uh, in that I'm talking about the, the arbitrary concept of a of a method and a type without really. I mean, I, I, know, I know you mentioned um, I I O, but uh, yeah, there, there are there are a few different different domains where different things would uh, would would apply and. Um, I've, I've tried to be as general as possible, but, but haven't, uh, haven't necessarily succeeded in all cases. Thank you.